Right, well, um, in many ways, I mean, my topic is imperialism past and present in the Middle East. And in many ways, the Middle East over the, the past century has been the most sort of privileged zone in which one can see the, the changes in the structure of imperialism and forms of imperialist rivalry and intervention uh, un unfolding. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, we're here because of an interest in the, the left in the Middle East, but even if you weren't so interested in the left in the Middle East, the Middle East is very interesting for any student of, of imperialism. Now, briefly, um, I'm going to say what I mean by imperialism. Um, as has been said, I've, I've written a book on, on imperialism where I go on at great length about what it is. But very briefly, um, I would argue that imperialism is, is what's, what happens when two forms of competition intersect, come together, interweave. And those are economic competition and geopolitical competition. Economic competition is the rivalries, crucially between capitalist <coughs> firms, which drives the whole dynamic of capitalism as a system. Um, geopolitical competition uh, consists in the rivalries among states for territory, influence, power, which is actually, and those rivalries have been going on for, for many centuries. I mean, they're really coextensive with the existence of the state and of class class society more, more generally. But what we see around the end of the 19th, 19th century is these two forms of competition merging together so that um, increasingly capitalist firms come to see the nation states they're associated with as necessary to defend their interests. And similarly, uh, nation states in their rivalries um, increasingly depend on a capitalist industrial base to support their their activities. So this is what imperialism is. And as I've said, the Middle East is a is a privileged um, uh, terrain on which we can see modern capitalist imperialism de de developing. So if you look, I mean, one can identify different phases in the history of imperialism in the Middle East. There's for the bulk of the 19th century, there are the attempts of the different Western, increasingly capitalist and imperialist powers to, to penetrate the region, and taking advantage of the decline and disintegration of the Ottoman Empire. Then, starting around the end of the 19th century, um, one has the colonial period in which uh, more and more fragments of the Ottoman Empire are incorporated into one or other of the uh, European colonial empires. And then after 1945, we have the American e era. I mean, that's a fairly common sense demarcation, uh, but just keep, keep it in mind um, while, uh, while I talk more about the developments. From the start, we see both geopolitical and economic um, considerations involved. So in many ways, I think the decisive um, move towards the colonization of the region comes when Britain and France uh, occupy Egypt in order to enforce uh, the country's debts uh, owed to them, a very sort of contemporary thing, thing to do. Um, uh, these days, it's uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the Frankfurt group that dominates the Eurozone don't yet use gunboats, but in many ways, it's a, it's a similar form of forcible intervention against states that's going on at the present time. And what happens as a result of that is that Britain elbows France out, which was at a certain point a potential cause of war between the two countries, and comes to dominate Egypt. The reasons for being interested in Egypt were partly economic, the debt, the fact that Egypt under Mehmet Ali in the early to middle uh, 19th century had already begun to experience a state-directed form of cap capitalist development and therefore had become an important cotton pr produ producer. So there were economic reasons, but also from a geopolitical point of view, Egypt was very uh, well placed strategically from the point of view of controlling access uh, 
to the most important single component of the British Empire in, in, in India. But very quickly, of course, oil comes to um, become the most overriding sim single factor in imperialist involvement in the region. Simon Bromley, in a very important book about oil and American power, describes oil as a strategic commodity. What does he mean by that? He means uh, that oil is a commodity that, isn't, that states don't simply need to sustain both their economic development and their military power, as of course increasingly they, they do as the 20th century un, unfolds, but also if you control this strategic economy, you can deny other states access to it. And this is extremely important in understanding, I think, particularly US strategy in the Middle East since the Second World War and in recent decades. But the focus on oil starts much, much earlier. Famously, before the Second World War, sorry, before the First World War, Winston Churchill, the British First Lord of the Admiralty, converts the British fleet, the main form of British power protection, from uh, being fueled by coal to being fueled by oil. And this coincides with the establishment, with the majority, government share of the, um, initially the Anglo-Persian oil company, late, later the Anglo-Iranian oil, oil company, which, as the name suggests, is about exploiting Iran's oil, and which is the origins of that very distinguished com company, BP. Um, after the First World War, when France and Britain succeed, finally, in getting hold of the Arab possessions of the Ottoman Empire and carve it up between them, Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, is adamant that as part of the British share, they get Mosul in what is now northern Iraq, critical um, then um, at, at the centre of what was then the main oil producing region in, in, in Iraq. Now, we see this process um, uh, go much further. Uh, after the Second World War as part of the process in, through which the United States supplants Britain as the dominant um, imperial, imperialist power. And it's very interesting how quickly the US starts to move in uh, to the Middle East. Um, there's the famous Yalta talks in February 1945 between Stalin, uh, Churchill, and Roosevelt that decided the post-war shape of Europe, or tried to decide it at any rate. Um, Roosevelt left the um, Yalta talks early in order to fly to the Middle East and meet three kings. Now, two of them turned out not to be that important. One was King Farouk of Egypt. The second was Haile Selassie, the recently restored uh, Ethiopian emperor, both to fall victim to revolutions in their own countries. Um, but the third was Ibn Saud, the Saudi king. And it's clear that the priority in the meeting was in, in Roosevelt's trip. This was when he was a dying man. He died a couple of months later. His priority was to meet I Ibn Saud. The reason, as someone in the US State Department put it at the time, Saudi oil reserves constitute a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. And the US was, was determined that that prize would be theirs, and they continue to be determined about that. I mean, the Saudi state had been established with British support. Um, actually, the two, um, two different Brit bits of the British uh, imperial state um, were on different sides. The uh, Foreign Office supported the Hashemites, who now represented by King Abdullah of Jordan, who I have to say, <laughs> astonishingly, has just called for Assad to resign because he doesn't have the support of his people. I mean, how does Abdullah know how much support he has? Whoever elected him? Anyway, sorry, that's a sign. <laughs> that's just, a, I, I, can't, I can't resist uh, uh, denouncing. Anyway, the, the British Foreign Office supported the Hashemites, who were initially politically dominant in what's now Saudi Arabia and um, were also projected to be uh, rulers of uh, what's now Syria and Iraq. Um, but Ibn Saud drove the Hashemites out of what's now Saudi Arabia with the support of the British imperial government in India. 
Arnold Toynbee, a leading commentator at the time, said, as he put it, it would be more manly if the Foreign Office and the India Office had fought each other rather than through the intermediaries of the Hashemites and the Saudis. But although, it w although the Saudi monarchy depended initially on British support, the Americans moved very quickly to drag it into their sphere of influence. When Roosevelt returned uh, to Washington after his meeting with Ibn Saud, Lord Halifax, the British ambassador to the US, went to protest at this interference in the British sphere of influence in the Middle East. And what Roosevelt said was very interesting. He said, Persian oil is yours. We share the oil of Iraq and Kuwait. As for Saudi Arabian oil, it is ours. Um, so just as on a global scale, the imperial powers were carving up the world, so there was a carve up uh, going on in the Middle East. But Roosevelt was, was lying when he said that Iranian oil belonged to, belonged to Britain, because the outcome of the um, uh, nationalization of the Anglo-Iranian oil company by the nationalist government of Mossadegh in Iran in the early 1950s was of course a CIA coup that overthrew Mossadegh but the result of that coup to the British the fury of the British <laughs> their amazement was not that they got the oil Iran's oil back but they had to share it with the Americans and the French but particularly the Americans but of course the turning point in this process comes with Suez in 1956 when the American president Eisenhower intervenes to stop uh, the Anglo-French attack on, on e Egypt um, and effectively pulls the rug under the, the, the old European colonial powers. But although that was, in one sense, the, mo the moment at which the US sort of formally emerges at the do as a dominant power, imperial power in the, the Middle East, the background represents a large part of the problem that the US has had to <coughs> grapple with in the Middle East, that what the French and British were trying to do was to crush the forces of revolutionary nationalism and of pan-Arabism that were beginning to break down the whole system of colonial domination of the Middle East, and of which, of course, the Egyptian president Nasser was the, 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 main, the main symbol. And what you see with American policy is that is a kind of search for reliable allies in the region in a situation where colonialism is over, everyone is at least formally independent states, except for the Kurds, of course, um, and, um, and the US has to secure, secure its dominance of the region. The US searches for reliable allies who are subordinate but have sufficient power of their own to make a difference in the, in the region. Simple puppets aren't enough. These, these have to be relatively strong states that the US allies it to. Now, sometimes this is an associated with the Nixon doctrine articulated by President Nixon in 1969 when he said that the US no longer was going to rely on its own military power to um, dominate the world, uh, but would have privileged allies in different, different regions. Um, but in fact, in fact, the search for allies, reliable allies in the Middle East, goes, starts much earlier. Of course, the starting point is Israel. Isra the, the whole Zionist project is critically premised upon getting the backing of the dominant imperial power in the region. First the Ottomans, then the British, and since 1945, the, the Americans. The advantage of the Israelis is that they don't have anywhere else to go. They can't survive without American support. The disadvantage is that um, the combination of uh, Israel's policy of using overwhelming force against Arab states and the Palestinians, plus of course the Palestinian question itself, means that uh, Israeli interventions tend to be toxic. So you can see even the Reagan administration in the 1980s embarrassed by Israel's war in Lebanon. And of course, the is Israeli attack on Lebanon more recently in 2006 was a disaster from the point of view of the US and Britain, and not very good from Israel's point of view. So you can rely on Israel in a certain sense because it's nowhere else to go, but Israel is a problematic ally as well. <coughs> 
So who else is there? Well, associated with the Nixon doctrine, there was the there was Iran under the Shah restored to power as a result of the coup of 1953. Um, and particularly once Britain finally withdrew from the Gulf region in 1971, the Shah was the obvious candidate to maintain order in the region. The problem was that the Shah had uh, fantasies of you know, restoring the historic Persian Empire, spent vast amounts of money on building up Iranian military power, which was problematic in all sorts of ways because it threatened other states in the region, it took resources away from domestic development and so on, and of course the Shah's regime blew up with the revolution between 1977 and 1979, which is the big, biggest single defeat American imperialism has suffered in, in the region. and. Uh, which um, forced a revision of the Nixon Doctrine with the Carter Doctrine of 1980, where Carter said that any attempt to grab the oil of the Middle East was a direct threat to US national security and would be dealt with by force. That's the originating point, also the establishment of US Central Command, as it's now called, which is the military apparatus through which the US has waged its successive wars in the, in the Middle East and in, um, in, 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 in Central Asia. But the, the problem of the Shah, um, the Shah, the, the debate of the Shah's regime illustrates one of the great problems that the US has found in the Middle East, which is that it's all very well to say you've got a client, you give him lots of money, you give him lots of weapons, you help him torture domestic opponents, that's all, that's all good. But thereby you become a prisoner of your client. So the Americans often were very dubious about the Shah's demands for yet more weapon systems, but they felt obliged to do to offer it, to provide him with them. Where the uh, Americans felt constrained about talking to the opposition in in Iran because that would be seen as undermining the, the, the Shah. And that meant that when the revolution developed, they had very few options, and the options that they had disappeared very quickly. And this is a pattern that has repeated itself, not just in the Middle East, actually. I mean, I think there's a similar pattern in Afghanistan today. Then, of course, there's Egypt, the most important country in the Arab world, the industrial and um, cultural hub of the Ar Arab world. Um, the US seriously attempted to establish a friendly relationship with NASA, particularly under Kennedy and, and jo Johnson. And there's a turning point when Johnson promises the Israelis in 1967 he isn't going to do what Eisenhower did and intervene to stop their offensive against, against Egypt. So they try with NASA, doesn't work out, but under Sadat and Mubarak, you have much more reliable allies who critically, with the peace treaties with Israel, uh, mean that Israel doesn't have to worry about its southern flank anymore. It doesn't have to worry about a military threat from the big, biggest Ar and most powerful Arab state, which is critical to Israel's ability, in particular, to unleash horrendous violence in Lebanon against the Palestinians and, and, and so on. So that from a strategic point of view, this was an absolutely crucial development and it um, is reinforced when Mubarak becomes an extremely reliable ally in the war against terrorism. Well, now we've seen a repetition of the Iran experience uh, with, the, with the revolution of, the, of this year. And one of the most significant developments has been when demonstrations the demonstrations have directed themselves not simply against the remnants of the Mubarak regime or the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, but have directed themselves against the presence of the State of Israel in Egypt it, itself, indicating that the revolution has a dynamic that threatens to break up the whole system of alliances that has held the region again. Two, two more allies to talk about, or potential allies. One is, one is of course, Iraq. And there are two phases with Iraq. First of all, there's the alliance with Saddam in order to contain the Iranian revolution, which 
uh, of course, goes wrong very badly when uh, Saddam misunderstands what he's allowed to do um, and seizes Kuwait um, in August 1990, precipitating the, the wars that lead to his overthrow. Now, the invasion of Iraq in March 2003 was supposed to turn Iraq into this safe, reliable ally, partly because of the problematic character of the only other ally left around, which I'm going to come to in a minute. But of course, that was, that was a total disaster. The um, relative stabilization of Iraq in the past few years um, has involved the US part, uh, critically has been to, for political reasons rather than the military surge that the US mounted. Uh, several several years ago, and involves has it involved the American occupation forces trying to strike a balance between the um, the Shia, Shia parties that dominate the government and the the what shall I say non Al Qaeda uh, Sunni <coughs> insurgents. Um, so it was a very delicate political deal. Geopolitically, however, the outcome is a, is a disaster. The main beneficiary of the overthrow of Saddam. Has been, has been Iran, who finds their major local opponent removed, which is a great influence on the Iranian government, to the extent that what is supposed to be a US client regime, first of all, has forced the Americans to withdraw their forces by the end of the year, and secondly, follows the Iranian line of supporting Assad. Um, so, <laughs> the, I mean, this was a disaster. Really, and it's very important to underline that because people say, "Oh, you know, really, they made lots of, you know, Blackwater made lots of money out of I I Iraq, and so, you know, it was really a success for them." So it's very important to to see relative to the goals that they had when they invaded Iraq, which was to entrench their domination of the region and to increase their flexibility. It has been a total failure. Okay, that leaves. Of course, Saudi Arabia, and also the other uh, Gulf sheikdoms. Now, Adam Hanier, in a in an article that I've read and in a book that I'm afraid I haven't, has developed a very interesting analysis of the Gulf Cooperation Council as not just a kind of strategic partner to the to the U.S. in in the, in the region, but as um, a distinctive form of capitalism, which has spread out from its basis in, of course, course oil to, to retail and real estate and construction and so on and so forth, that is based upon the exploitation of, of migrant uh, labor that's increasingly integrated across the Gulf, um, at, that operates regionally and that is also locked into the global circuits of, of capital. I mean, when when people talk about how the US deficit is financed, they tend to emphasize the flow of money from China, and that is very important. But there's also a very important flow of, mo of, of money that comes, uh, that helps to sustain the U US economy that comes from the Gulf, that comes from the oil producing states of the, the Gulf. So this is, this, the, the, the evolution of the Gulf in the past few decades is important. And if we look what's happening in the rest of the region, clearly this is the, the kind of base of counter-revolution. Um, the, the Gulf Cooperation Council intervened in Bahrain to crush, crush the rev revolution there. They're putting a lot of money into Egypt to try to, to stabilize the situation. When the US is forced to withdraw from Iraq, a lot of the forces will be redeployed in different, different parts of the, the Gulf. Um, the, um, the, the, the GCC are playing a complicated game in relation to what's happening in Syria. So the most reliable set of allies the US has is, is represented by the Gulf Cooperation Council. So that's good from the Americans' point of view, but it's also, also problematic. Uh, you don't get, as my reference to King Abdullah indicates, you don't get any democratic credi credibility by allowing yourself to a bunch of absolute, absolute rulers. And we have to remember that behind, one of the factors behind the drive 
to invade Iraq was um, uh, the idea, articulated particularly by the neoconservatives, but re representing real problems, that the US needed to become t less dependent on the, on the, on the Saudis. Um, what's his name? Wolfowitz, the Deputy Defense Secretary, in many ways the main architect of the invasion of Iraq, politically, explained that one reason uh, for invading Iraq was to be able to move American troops out of Saudi Arabia where they caused all sorts of polit political problems and so, so on and so forth. Th those problems haven't, haven't gone away at, in, in, a, in any sense. So to some extent, the, um, I mean, the Americans will have to hang on to the alliance with the Saudis and the rest of the GCC because that's one of the main assets that they have left in the region, but it's, it's, um, it's an indication of the restriction of the pos possibilities available to them, that that's what they're dependent on. That, that's who they can really rely on in the, in the, current, in the current situation. Um, so, if, yeah, now I get a, I get a finish shortly. So, if we look at this, um, I mean, I've used, I've gone through the U.S.'s different actual or potential allies as a, as a way of bringing out the kind of problems that the U.S. has confronted in, in trying to manage the, the, re, the, the region, and also the, the narrowing of options that it's, that it's faced. I mean, of course, if the counter-revolution you know, were victor victorious in Egypt in a short measure, then that would gravely ease, ease its options. But uh, they would be mad. Fortunately, they would be mad to counter, counter on that. Can I say, sorry, another, another thing that's worth saying, and which is also to do with the problem of being a prisoner of your clients, is that both Israel and the Saudis uh, are... are um, I mean, although there are certainly deep divisions in Israel about this, but certainly within the Israeli establishment and within the Saudi kingdom, there's a ser serious campaign for an attack on I Iran. And given all the setbacks that the US has suffered in the, in the region, this would be an enormously dangerous undertaking for the, for the US to mount. I mean, I'd be interested to know uh, what people think, because there's the chatter about an attack on Iran has risen recently and there's clearly lots of dirty tricks going on I mean this there was an Iranian colonel who's a technical expert who was blown up the other day you know who blew him up you know I would guess it was a joint Mossad CIA operation um, so there's there's a lot of stuff that there's a there's a build up of of chatter and something slightly more than chatter, this conspiracy that the Iranians are alleged to have to assassinate the Saudi am ambassador in the US and so, so on and so forth, which I think in part reflects the pressure from the US's allies in the, the region, most reliable allies in the region, uh, for an attack on Iran. But, you know, I think that this is not a road that Obama will want to undertake because if we move to, from a Middle East into a global optic, there's a strong case for saying that the US has allowed itself to become bogged down in these wars in the Middle East and in, and in Central Asia at, a, at precisely the wrong historic moment, both because the economic crisis has weakened the US globally and because of the way in which the state that has emerged most successfully from the crisis both economically and geopolitically, is, is China. And um, there's clearly a very powerful lobby in the American establishment who, who says, not forget about the Middle East, it's too important to forget about it, partly because US control of the Middle East uh, is a potential way of squeezing China, but we have to concentrate on, on China and on the glo global picture. So I'm very skeptical that, that there's that, that the U.S. that there's a strong lobby in the U.S. as yet for an, an attack on Iran. But I'd be interested to know what other other people thought. Just to conclude, it's very easy to look at what the U.S. has done in the Middle East and all the horrors that it's perpetrated and the vast 
military resources that it still has in the region and that it will keep even once it's pushed out of Iraq and be uh, fixated on its, on its power. But I think if you look closely at the history of America's involvement in the M Middle East, it's been one of <sighs> desperate crisis management. Uh, the, the Bush adventure was an attempt to break out of the, the set of traps that the US has found itself in the region, but it failed. And particularly now, thanks to the Arab revolutions, the number of traps has, 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 has increased. It doesn't mean that American imperialism is simply a paper tiger, but we're talking about a tiger that has been weakened. And of course, you know, there's a cliche that a wounded animal is particularly dangerous, but it is very badly wounded.